Thank you. I'm um, very honoured and slightly daunted to be here talking about Alexander Corder. Um, but uh, his long and fascinating career can't be covered in the short time I've got today. So instead I'm going to share some of the British Film Institute's uh, collections related to him and reflect on what they reveal about him as a person, a filmmaker and a businessman. Corder's impact on British cinema cannot be overestimated, and I will explore some of the legacies of his incredible <laughs> achievements during his 23 years in England. Each year, the British Academy recognises the outstanding British film, and this award is dedicated to Alexander Corder. The fact that the highest award for British filmmaking bears the name of a Hungarian who settled in Britain 90 years ago is recognition of his importance to the industry. Browsing through the BFI collections, the overriding impression that you get is the sheer audacity and the flamboyance of both his filmmaking and his business ventures. I've taken the title of the presentation, Dreamer and Spellbinder, from an article written uh, about him in the 1930s. It summarizes the combination of imagination and overreaching ambition on the one hand, and the visual magic that he brought to the screen on the other. The actor Ralph Richardson said, Corder was the nearest thing to a magician that I ever met in my life. He could make the impossible seem possible. After producing and directing here in Hungary, Corder moved to Austria and soon established his own company. Released in 1922 was this Corder-directed version of the biblical tale of Samson and Delilah, inventively told through a modern framing story. Starring his first wife, Maria Corder, the film combined lavish sets and exoticism, features that Corder understood were valuable selling points for screen entertainment. Charles Drazen, in his definitive book on Corder, asserts that his real talent was satire and subtle social drama. But he certainly exploited the appeal of spectacle that cinema did so well. Many years later, David Lean recalled being reluctant to direct the Venice set film Summer Madness, feeling the story was too thin. Corder told him just to capture the city's stunning locations. Give them an eyeful, David, he advised. Corder made the inevitable move to Hollywood in 1926, contracted to First National. The Private Life of Helen of Troy was his second film, also starring Maria Corder. Again, the film combined historical setting with observational wit and was a financial success, showing Corder's ability to create a film with both visual and intellectual pleasures. This was the pre-code era in American cinema, as you can see from these rather racy press book pictures. The Squall was Corder's first sound film, and he was excited by the project at first due to its Hungarian set tale of a seductive gypsy played by Myrna Loy. Lilies of the Field, made in the summer of 1929, was his last film for First National and was sold in a similarly suggestive manner. Both films were financially successful, but Corder was not happy with them. He didn't like Hollywood, and he yearned for the control, both creative and financial, that he'd had in Europe. But his time in America had been a vital learning experience and also had seen him through the transition from silent to sound, which had interrupted the careers of many other directors. His previous experience was a major boost to Corder's reputation in England. The British film industry was struggling to, to compete with America and directors who had worked in both Europe and Hollywood were regarded as potential saviors of the national industry. In 1931, Corder arrived in England, a country still grappling with the arrival of sound, ill-equipped studios, a lack of investment, and a lack of vision. With Paramount funding behind him, he made his first film, Service for Ladies. It was a quota film which was made to, um, to meet the government-imposed percentages of British films that had to be shown in cinemas. And most were cheap and poorly made, but Corder bucked the trend. The film was released in 1932 to enormous praise and stands out as one of the most technically advanced and sophisticated films made in Britain in the early 1930s. It was so good that it was a rare British release in America, and this actually saved it for posterity because the only existing print was found in an American archive. It was based on a play by Ernst Weider, adapted by Corder's friend Lajos Spiro, and even its very English-looking star here uh, had Hungarian roots. Corder's loyalty to his countrymen was legendary, and he welcomed the Hungarian talent of all kinds into his circle, 
most notably, of course, his own brothers, Zoltan and Vincent. Service for Ladies announced Corder's arrival onto the scene, and the industry began to pay attention to him. Controlling the production process was vital to Corder, and he lost no time in establishing his own company, London Films. Here we see him, pipe in hand, at the top there, next to the camera, uh, on location directing The Private Life of Henry VIII at Hampton Court Palace, which was the residence of the controversial English king. Released in 1933, the film transformed the fortunes of British cinema. Like The Private Life of Helen of Troy, it represented and reinterpreted a historical figure for a modern audience. Corder had discovered the wealth of British acting talent, and he recognised the screen potential of Charles Lawton. Casting him as Henry VIII was at the same time obvious, yet completely inspired. A financial and critical success at home and abroad, the film was nominated for the Best Picture Oscar, and Charles Lawton won the Oscar for Best Actor, an award that Corder must surely take some of the credit for. Corder had effectively invented the genre that was to become Britain's biggest cinematic export, the heritage film. He recognised that British history, culture and literature was a marketable resource that had great appeal for global audiences, as it still does today. Look at The Crown and Downton Abbey. So this is one of my favourite objects from our collection. I don't know how well you can see it. So this is an invitation to dinner at the Savoy Hotel, which is one of London's most elegant restaurants, on the 28th of September 1935, autographed at the top by Corder himself. This dinner was organised for Corder by his staff, out of gratitude to him, and just shows how popular he was. Years later, Sir Laurence Olivier said, in working association, we loved him as actors and as craftsmen because he loved us and he loved our problems too. The warm radius of his friendship ranged from the humblest studio technician to the highest personages in the land. Corder could be stubborn, intractable and difficult, but he was also warm, generous and had a sense of humour which generated affection and loyalty from those around him. Corda understood the appeal of film stars, so for the 1937 film, Night Without Armour, he aimed high, contracting Marlena Dietrich to come to Britain to play a Russian aristocrat. So the BFI holds this nice poster for the film, uh, as well as the contract that Dietrich signed there in September 1935. It specifies that she is to be the sole star in the film, and according to her co-star, Robert Donat, she certainly behaved that way during the shoot, making excessive demands and stealing every scene from him. She was paid $250,000 for being in the film, and I believe that this poster actually violates her contract, which specifies that her name must be larger than anyone else's. Corda had by now officially retired from directing, but when the director of this film, Jacques Fédère, fell ill during the filming, Corda stepped in to take over until he was better. How many studio bosses could do that? The British press was fascinated by Alexander Corder, and you can see here a few of the many articles written about him in the 30s from our files. As director Carol Reed observed, the value he was to English pictures was that he was an international figure. He had an international outlook towards films. His rapid rise to success meant his opinions were sought after in the hope that it might reveal his secrets. But he was also appealing as a larger-than-life character, charming, witty, and always voicing new ideas. Corder was forever thinking big and talking big, and many of the films he dreamed of making never materialised. So one of these articles, called Castles in the Air, at the top, uh, listed all the unmade films that he had announced to the press during the 1930s. These included films about Lawrence of Arabia, the life of, of Nijinsky, and the history of flight. Another unrealised project was a film version of the French play Cyrano de Bergerac, starring Charles Lawton. The rights to the play were purchased at great expense, and Vincent Corder even got as far as making Charles Lawton's false nose. But the film was never made. Uh, so if anyone's looking for a project at the moment, the extensive correspondence held at the BFI about London films, unmade films, could definitely warrant a book-length study. In 1935, Corder had purchased a piece of land, to fulfil his dream of building his own studio, transforming a quiet village on the outskirts of London into a hive of filmmaking activity. He constructed a huge, ambitious complex along Hollywood lines. For Corder, it had to be the biggest and the best. Seven sound stages, film processing facilities, cutting rooms, the largest private power plant in the country, and a canteen that fed 20,000 people every week. 
So I'm going to show you a clip from a promotional film about the studio, which was released in 1939, and gives a flavour of Corder's British Hollywood. A new activity and a new importance has been brought to Denham through the erection of the studios, and Denham Station has awakened to a new dignity. Hundreds of studio employees travel down from London daily. Carpenters, plasterers, typists, they all queue up, ready to clock in at the imposing studio gates. And the routine and discipline of a modern factory applies to the men and women who make modern entertainment. Each employee clocks in and then quietly goes off to his or her job, and the same routine applies to the crowd artist or extra employed in production. Not all the employees travel by train. A number of them have cars. And the petrol bill for this lot would be quite staggering. Well, here we have another angle of the crowd artists checking in. Each artist receives a voucher, and at the end of the day's work, hands it to the cashier in exchange for a paycheck. Come on, you know the time for clocking in. Jump to it. Oh, it slipped right out of my hand. Now, here is one of the most important departments in the studio, the wardrobe. If it's a costume picture, each artist is supplied with a costume essential to the period. Tinkers, tailors, soldiers, sailors, they all come alike to the wardrobe. Certainly one of the most interesting departments in any film studio is the makeup room, and is exceptionally so in the Denham Studios. Highly paid experts are employed to repair the ravages of nature, and many an ugly duckling has become an extremely elegant swan, having passed through the expert hands of the makeup men. Sadly, by the time that this film was completed, London Films had such huge debts that Corder had lost control of his studio. Later that year, it was combined with Pinewood to form DMP. Soon after, the Second World War broke out, and film companies had to radically rethink their plans. Corder devoted his talents uh, to supporting the war effort, and in 1942, he became Sir Alexander Corder, after being knighted by George VI for his services to the country. During the war years, he spent a lot of time in America using studio facilities there and later negotiating deals with Hollywood studios. Corder was always on the lookout for literary works to adapt for the screen. And in relation to this, in our collections, I found this telegram to Corder sent in March 1946, where he was staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. It outlines his proposal to purchase the rights to The King's General, which was the latest novel by English writer Daphne du Maurier. She, of course, is best known as author of Rebecca, filmed by Alfred Hitchcock in 1939. Perhaps due to the success of that film, du Maurier demanded £65,000 for the rights, which was a, a massive sum for film rights at that time. Between five and ten was, was pretty good, but 65 was, was unheard of. Um, but Corder agreed, and a contract was drawn up to pay her over a 20-year period at a rate of about £3,000 a year. Over the next six or seven years, uh, writers were contracted to work on screenplays, but the film was never made. The payments to Du Maurier continued into the 1960s. Such huge sums are typical of Alexander Corder's largesse in business and account for the massive debts he accumulated. His generosity and his profligacy were legendary. As well as big spending, Corder was famous for his charisma. It was his persuasive power, after all, that enabled him to get the investment for his costly projects. On the left, you can see him with famous science fiction writer H.G. Wells in around 1935. Wells wasn't keen to let London films adapt his work for the screen and had to talk him round. But Things to Come is perhaps his most ambitious and visually stunning production, as you'll see for yourself if you attend the screening on Saturday. Fifteen years later, you can see Corder with Orson Welles uh, during the production of The Third Man, which is recognised as one of the greatest British films ever made. The director, Carol Reed, credited Corder for the genesis of the film, as it was he who suggested that Graham Greene should go to post-war Vienna to find inspiration for a story. In fact, much of the finest British cinema of the 1940s and 50s is down to Alexander Corder. For he brought together Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, and he su supported other talent such as Reed and David Lean, as well as one of our few women directors, Wendy Toy. Corder had returned to directing as part of his patriotic wartime duty, making That Hamilton Woman and Perfect Strangers. 
By 1946, he had started a new company and unveiled a slate of lavish Technicolor titles, including one he was to direct himself, An Ideal Husband, based on the play by Oscar Wilde. These stills show Corder in 1947 directing for the last time, at the center of intense activity around him. According to the film's publicity, oh, despite, sorry, despite his financial difficulties, he refused to cut corners. According to the film's publicity, this replica of London's Hyde Park Corner, you can see there, was built at Shepperton Studios and was the largest set ever to be built for a British film. It took 100 men 60 days to create it. The interior sets were no less impressive. They were hung with real silk and genuine antique tapestries worth thousands of pounds were loaned for the film. Corder also boasted that it was the fastest Technicolor film production in Britain, shot in just 66 days. Sadly, it was not a big success. On the 23rd of January, 1954, Corder died, aged 62. And this headline is typical of the many reporting his passing, referring to him as the most spectacular showman in British pictures. On the 4th of March, the BBC broadcast a television program in which film stars and directors shared memories and mourned his loss. This was completely unprecedented for anyone other than, a, say, a prime minister or the royal family. A copy of this program survives in the BFI's archive, and it's a wonderful tribute to him by figures like Vivian Lee, David Lean, and Sir Laurence Olivier. In 1966, the BBC made another program about Corder, the epic that never was. It told of London Film's <coughs> aborted version of I, Claudius, directed by Joseph von Sternberg. The few scenes of the film that were shot in 1937 had just been discovered among the ruins of Denham Studios. I was Alex Corder's special script girl, or continuity, for years. And as such, I was in charge of the continuity on I, Claudius. You may wonder what on earth I'm doing sitting in this terrible, derelict old room. But actually, I'm in one of the rooms of what was the mansion of Denham Fisheries. And years ago, when we made this film, right, 20 year, 28 years ago, I think it was, when the filming was being taking place in the studios at the other end of the ground, this old house was the production headquarters. Alex's own office was actually in the room above the one that I'm sitting in. It's very sad and rather nostalgic to go up there now and see all the broken glass and the plaster peeling off the walls. But in those days, when it was all beautifully furnished, Alex used to sit at his desk up there, and it was from that desk, looking out onto the beautiful scene of the trees and the water that you can see from the window, it was there that Alex planned this film, which was to be the best film he'd ever made, I, Claudius. I was 16 at the time, and an art student at Chelsea Polytechnic studying scenic design, which is how I started in this business anyway. And already people were talking about the fantastic sets at Denham. And I was fortunate enough to go down myself and see them. And they were fantastic. Corder's brother, Vincent, designed the sets. And in the huge new studios at Denham, which had been specially built for Corder, an army of craftsmen were recreating the palaces, the Senate House, and the temples of ancient Rome in all their splendor. That I, Claudius, was never finished is perhaps the greatest tragedy of Corder's English career and a poignant reflection on his legacy, which contains many triumphs but a larger number of failures. At this point in the 1960s, when this was made, British cinema was having a renaissance and some of the facilities at Denham Studios continued to be used uh, up until 2014. But how sad to see the deserted and derelict offices where Corder once worked his magic. Today, Denham Studios is a huge housing complex. So along Stanley Kubrick Way stand the houses named after George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Yet there's little recognition of the man whose vision created the great studio in 1935. And this was the main building. It's still standing. It's the only bit that survived that had the cutting rooms in it originally. Uh, all fancy uh, apartments now. Um, but while the edifices that he created may not have survived intact, the structures he put in place to support and encourage British creativity have left abundant evidence of his importance to our national filmography. 
Alexander Corder's unique combination of intelligence, flair, and determination transformed British cinema into a national industry that could at last compete with Hollywood. As Sir Laurence Olivier said in his eulogy to him, quoting from Shakespeare's Hamlet, we shall not look on his like again. Thank you.